the excursions of the word. In the beginning was the word. It is not the beginning that is difficult, the affirmation of the word that is God, and the assertion of his incarnation. It is the end. Not because it's missing from the Gospel of John, but because there are two, each of which says that there are still an infinite number of things to say, an infinite number of signs to reveal, which go to prove that the word did indeed become flesh. Criticism has, it's true, declared that the second ending of the gospel is apocryphal. In a coarse style, the narrative relates a new apparition of Jesus at Tiberias and a new miraculous fishing expedition in a strangely vivid popular tone. Peter dives into the lake to rejoin the Saviour, who has appeared on the shore, and the apostles find a light campfire on the shore that is both a brazier to grill fish and also the light that has come down into the world. It is as if, to bring his book to completion, the author had to make the great story of the incarnate word pass into all the little stories of the everyday labours of the people. As if he had also to assure the passage of the witness of the incarnate word into sacred writing, from the scriptures to writing, from writing to the world, which is its destination. After a triple question posed by Jesus to Peter, which corresponds to the three cock crows and renders legitimacy to the head of the church, the text ends by testifying that its compiler is indeed the disciple chosen by Jesus to relate the deeds of the embodiment of the word. The critics are probably right. The demonstration is too obvious not to have been added on. But the important thing is precisely that this addition was necessary that the first ending straight away required a second one, which unrolls its logic and transforms its symbolic function into a prosaic narrative. To ensure the passage from the subject of the book to the narrator of the story, to project the book toward a reality that is not the one it speaks of, but the one in which it must become a deed, a power of life. Thus the flaw is revealed at the moment of saying goodbye to the word made flesh and sending its book into the world, at the instant of letting writing say all by itself what the sacred writings say. An entire tradition of thinking and writing has nonetheless been nourished by the example of the book par excellence, the book of the word made flesh, the ending that returns to the beginning, the two testaments folded in on each other, romantic Bibles of the nations or of humanity, books of our century skillfully constructed according to the game that comes full circle. How many books have been dreamt of following this model of coincidence? How many have been created only for the sake of their last sentence, for the glorious rhyme it makes with the first? But the over-easy confidence in the virtues of the book closed in on itself encounters, under another form, the paradox of the ending. The difficult thing is not to stop the book. It is not the last sentence that poses a problem, but the next to last. It is not the void into which the finished book must throw itself, but the space that separates it from its end and allows the end to come. Balzac, the writer of newspaper serials, has already given Le Curé de Village, the village priest, its ending. Balzac, the novelist, however, will need two years and 200 more pages to catch up with that ending. The conclusion of Le Ton Retrouvé, Time Regained, was conceived at the same time as the beginning of Du Côté de Chez Swan, Swan's Way, in 1908. No doubt Proust revised the perpetual adoration in the library and the belle de tête that follows it in the salon many times. But a strange distance has taken shape on the path that leads there, a war that the novelist could not foresee had to happen, and 150 supplementary pages for the book to reach the end, from which it had begun. And in this space that separates Véronique Crasselin, a character in Balzac's The Village Priest, from her death, or the Proustian narrator from Revelation, it is not the void that threatens, but rather, as we shall see, the risk of an overabundance the clash of a truth made flesh that can overwhelm the fragile truth of the book. 
So a strange game is played between words and their body. Since Plato and the Cratylus, it has been understood that words do not resemble what they say. That is the price of thought. Any resemblance must be resisted, but by identifying this resemblance with the poetic lie, Plato gave himself too easy a task. For poetry and fiction have the same demand. That is what Mallarmé says, correcting his Cratylian reveries of an amateur philologist with the poet's rigour. If chance had not made the very sound of nuit, night, light, and that of jour, day, dark, verse would not exist, which rewards the faults of language and makes only the absent one of all flowers rise up. But doesn't this condemnation of resemblance, which modern poetry has inherited from ancient philosophy, itself settle the question too quickly? For there are many ways of imitating and many things that can be resembled. And when it was said that sound did not resemble meaning, or that a sentence was like no object in the world, only the most obvious of the doors through which words can go toward what are not words has been closed, and the least essential too. For it is not by describing that words acquire their power. It is by naming, by calling, by commanding, by intriguing, by seducing, that they slice into the naturalness of existences, set humans on their path, separate them, and unite them into communities. The word has many other things to imitate besides its meaning or its referent. The power of speech that brings it into existence, the movement of life, the gestures of an oration, the effect it anticipates, the addressee whose listening or reading it mimics beforehand. Take, read, reader, throw away this book. If resemblance in painting is denounced, isn't that because it fixes all movements on one single plane? That indeed is what the criticism of Plato's Phaedrus definitively tells us when it denounces the vain portrayal of Logos presented by the silent letters of the script. The problem is not that the resemblance is unfaithful, but that it is too faithful, still attached to what has been said when already it should be elsewhere, near where the meaning of what has been said must speak. The written letter is like a silent painting that retains on its body the movements that animate the Logos and bring it to its destination. The chattering silence of the dead letter blocks the multiple powers by which the Logos constitutes its theatre, imitates itself to perform living speech, to travel the path of its oration, to become seed able to bear fruit in the soul of the disciple. And the entire text of Phaedrus is only the deployment of all the luxuries by which writing exceeds itself in the mime of living speech, of speech on the march that traverses all the figures of discourse in movement, walking around, dialogue, debate, parody, myth, oracle, prayer. This is the theatre that will be at issue here the way a text gives itself the body of its incarnation to escape the fate of the letter released into the world, to mime its own movement between the place of thought, of mind, of life, whence it comes, and the place toward which it heads, a sort of human theatre where speech, parole, becomes action, takes possession of souls, leads bodies, and gives rhythm to their walk. It will be a question of that superior imitation by which language tries to escape the deceptions of imitation. The theatre initiated by Socrates' stroll and Phaedrus' walk is really that of the excursions, sorti, of the word. But there are good and bad excursions. As to the bad, a fine example is those catastrophic excursions of Don Quixote, the man who wants to complete the book and believes that this consists of finding resemblances to the book in reality. And then there are the good excursions, the ones that refuse to crash against the walls, hurling themselves in front of images, and thus apply themselves to erasing the separation that is the correlative to mimetic prestige. So it is a matter of finding, like Plato, beneath words and resemblances, the power by which words are set in motion and become deeds. Thus the young Wordsworth, while reading Cervantes, dreams of a world where the mind could leave an imprint of itself in an element all its own, as close as possible to its own nature. 
But if he dreams in this way, it is, of course, because he is the contemporary of that French Revolution that claimed to lead a few old words back to their original power, words like liberty, equality, or nation, to make them the song of a people on the march. With that revolution begins the dream of which Rimbaud gave the most dazzling version, that of a poetry that resounds with the new harmony, whose footstep makes the new man rise up and march. Illuminations, for a reason. But there also begins the conflict of poetry with itself. It asserts its freedom and separates itself from the prose of the world, only at the cost of making itself like a music of bodies on their way toward the reign of the spirit or the new man, toward a truth possessed in a soul and body where it loses itself. And its work is then to cast aside its own utopia at the risk of withdrawing itself from language, of putting the key under the door, like Rambeau, or of making itself, like Mandelstam, the oblivion of the word it was about to utter. Thus is defined a singular relationship between literature, philosophy, and politics, of which Althusser and Deleuze are the witnesses here. In the work of Althusser, the philosopher tries to condemn the religious myth of the book and distinguish the reality unique to thought from all lived reality. And this preoccupation seems to agree precisely with the rigour of the intellectual communist, anxious to escape the fate of quixotic, well-intentioned souls. But it is exactly this conjunction that contains the flaw, imposes theatre and its exit, sorti, as models of the passage from text to reality, and creates a dramaturgy of writing in which the resources of typography transpose the movements of Socrates and his disciple into the effect anticipated by their speech. As for Deleuze, he makes his entire philosophy a challenge of the mimetic figure of thought whose father is Plato, the accuser of the evil mimesis. And his analysis of works of literature contrasts the pure materiality of the formula with the mirages of representation. But the formula is both of those things. It is the pure play of language, and it is the magic word that opens doors. But the door that Deleuze charges literature with opening is, like Althusser, that of a people still to come. Thus, Bartleby, the human formula, becomes a mythological figure of filiation and finally identifies himself with the mediator above all others, the one who opened the gates of Rambo's ancient hell, the son of the word or the word incarnate, the Christ or brother of us all. The relationship between literature and philosophy in connection with politics seems to function in reverse Philosophy, which wants to separate its language from all the glamour of mimesis and its effect from all literary vacuity, does so only at the price of uniting with the most radical forms by which literature mimics the incarnation of the word. With these mad sorties of philosophy, our era readily contrasts the wisdom of literature, separating the solitude of words and the pure chance of their encounters from the philosophical and political mirages of incarnation, but this wisdom is not linked to some more original conception of the nature of language, or to some more lucid view of the communal incarnation of the word. It is rather a logic of perseverance in its being. Literature lives only by the separation of words in relation to any body that might incarnate their power. It lives only by evading the incarnation that it incessantly puts into play. That is the paradox Balzac runs up against when, in a novel, he denounces the evil that novels produce, and when he discovers that the only solution to evil, good writing, imposes silence on the novelist. It is the paradox that Proust resolves when he encounters in the epic of the nation at war a radical symbol of incarnate truth. To this truth made flesh, which takes its own truth away from fiction, he responds with the sacrilegious passion that nails onto the rock of pure matter, not only the aesthete Charles, but the very spirit that bears words to prove itself by becoming living flesh. And of course, this final struggle, which gives discourse and fiction their own truth, must always be begun anew. Against all nihilist wisdom, we will insist that is what makes it worth it.